Good evening and welcome to this webinar on self-sabotage in trading. My name's Charlie Burton. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am a professional money manager here in the UK. I'm regulated uh, to manage money here. I've been trading for 27 years now and um, I've won trading competitions. I've been featured in TV documentaries over here and the usual stuff interviewed in the financial press etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, but tonight i'm here to deliver a webinar for you uh, on this interesting topic on self-sabotage so let's get into this first of all though we have to go through the risk disclaimer which is the material provided is for the purposes of information purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice the views information or opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author and not to the organization committee or other group or individual or company cfds are complex instruments and come with a high risk of losing money rapidly due to leverage 72 percent of retail traders account trader accounts lose money when trading cfds right let's get into the overview, first of all. So what we're going to actually be covering off. So the obvious ways that people self-sabotage. In fact, why don't I put it out to you? First and foremost, someone throw some at me. What are the obvious ways that people self-sabotage? We're going to be talking tonight about the less obvious ways, but let's get this started uh, with some of the obvious ways that self people self-sabotage. Over trading, I'm seeing chasing losses, greed, revenge trading. Yes, exactly. Yes, uh, manufacturing trades. Uh, yeah, out of nowhere, forcing a trade. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, we've got that. Um, yes, yeah, self sabotage with no stop losses. Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Pride, FOMO. Wow, they're all there. So that's the obvious stuff. What we want to do is delve into the the subtler arts of uh, self-sabotage here tonight and look at the less obvious ways that n that that can affect really up to 90 percent of traders and so and that you know they unwittingly fall into so what we're talking about here are the things that tonight there's two ways i'm going to pick up on two ways that up to 90% of traders unwittingly fall into. So, and we're going to look at how to test if you're part of that 90%, what adjustments you can make, and what the stats tell you to. So there's a fair bit that we're going to go through. I'm going to show you some um, some visuals on here as well of some, some tests as well. However, first... I need to go through this with you like I did um, last month as well. And this is this little micro site that I have uh, with Tickmill. So the, the website address is tickmill.link forward slash Charlie Burton. We'll come back to that, but I'll show you what it actually is because that's where if people haven't seen previous webinars that you will be able to see them this is this micro site i've just given the website there there's a lot of information on here you um you can even if you open an, a tick mill account you can get access actually into my trading community i have a live trading trading uh room which i'm in with my community five days a week so you can't you can look at all of that if you become an um if you're not already an account holder with tick mill and you would like to get access to my trading community you can get it for free Anyway, you can look at all of that. But really, if you scroll down, you'll see down here the educational webinars, they get put onto this microsite every month. So in about a week or two after tonight, then tonight's webinar will get put onto this site as well. So it's well worth your while keeping the link because then you can go into these. And if I scroll across, you can see different webinars going back over this past year or so. So um, there are all sorts of interesting content that we've covered off in those. So definitely well worth your while uh, looking at that. Right. 
And that is tickmill.link forward slash Charlie Burton. Okay, let's move on. So the less obvious types of sabotage. <laughs> now, these really do need considering. But first of all, I'm going to start you off with a trader story. Now, this trader story was is really recent. I was literally talking to this trader just the other day. And he'd been in a trade and price had been coming up. Can you see my pen as I'm putting this onto the screen? I just want to make sure that you can see the... Yes, you can. Right, good. So price had come up, old back, um, and he'd been in this trade from back down here somewhere. Okay. And so he'd been in a really nice profit. It had come up um, into the prior high and then rolled over. Okay. So he said, oh, I'm, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to hold on again. Um, every time that this happens, when I'm in a trade from down here, um, I'm not going to... And if it comes up and does this again, basically a double top in price, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to bank it. Okay. And I said, well, that's fine to have as a plan. But the problem with this is that he's basing this decision on one event. <laughs> so maybe it happened to him on another event as well, but he's basing the decision on one event. So this is so, so common in trading that traders, something will happen to a trader and then they will then make adjustments to their trading. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll talk about the double top, Richard. Um, they'll make adjustments to their trading, you know, on based on the, the experience of one event. Because at the point that price was up there, you don't know that it's going to be a double top, of course. At that point, price could have carried on going higher. So it's all very well saying, well, when price comes up to here, I'm going to bank it. And that's fine. If you want, you know, if he wants to adjust his plan so that every time price comes up, does a pullback and then comes back up to the prior high that he banks. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a new trading plan. What I'm what I'm saying is that, that this is a classic example of someone reacting to something that's happened. When actually, how much of the time does price do pullbacks and, and then go on to make new highs? So it's okay to bank his profit and say, do you know what, I've had enough. And if that's his plan, that's fine. But he's got to, what he's got to be careful of is he is the same trader that will then kick himself if he takes that next trade and it carries on going higher then it'll be like oh god why didn't i hold on to that trade <laughs> so what happens is a lot of traders will react to the the thing the experience that they've had and based on what the price has done on that event or maybe on just a couple of um on a couple of events and then they start to think well i've got to do something i have to change something and my point is he doesn't have to. And if he wants to and say, right, that's it, I'm going to always come out when there's a potential double top in price. There's nothing wrong with that. Change your plan. But at the same time, don't then moan and then start changing your plan again when you get into some trades with, that become those monster trades and just keep on going. So you can't have your cake and eat it. <laughs> so yeah, I thought it was an interesting story because it leads into this whole sabotage. Because potentially he could be sabotaging himself. And I'll explain as we go forwards here. Now, I appreciate people are writing comments, but I, I can't keep the, reading the comments whilst I'm in mid-flow now. So, uh, yeah, he, sorry, he could close half and do that. Absolutely. You know, that those sort of things are options. Okay. So is one or two instances where a trade has reversed enough to justify changing the strategy? This is the point. Is that enough to justify changing the strategy? Now, log logically, we know it's not. We know it's not. But 
people constantly change their strategy on very little data. That's the problem. So what we're talking about here is essentially strategy hopping. So strategy hopping is a less obvious type of sabotage. We've talked about the obvious stuff, revenge trading, all the things that you wrote down earlier on, FOMO, fear, over trading, all of those things. This is a more subtle one. And this is one that I think is very, very common out there where People have an experience and then think, oh, I don't want to trade with this strategy now. I'm going to ditch that. I'm going to move on to another one. I'm sure many of you who are here tonight can could hold your hand up and say, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> because most of us have done that at some point in our past. So, exactly, Susan, yeah. So, now there's nothing wrong with changing a strategy. So like that chap, there's nothing wrong with saying, do you know what? I'm going to change my rules on this. But like I said about that example earlier on, but don't moan when when something else happens, like in that example, and, it, and you know, his next trade becomes a, it, it would have carried on going higher and higher and higher. And then to get, oh, no, I want to change again. So you've got to properly embrace it. So let's um, move on from this. So there's nothing wrong with changing a strategy, but... Has it fallen outside the historical performance norms? So this is where you need to um, go back and test your strategy, your approach. Because a lot of the time, it may not have done. So if you, for example, if let's say your strategy goes into a drawdown period. So let's say... For whatever reason, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. So let's say you go into, you know, you're into a 10% drawdown. Okay. So your equity curve uh, is pulling back and it's pulled back from its last peak by 10%. And so in this example, exa this would be a typical sort of example whereby someone would say, oh, I don't like this strategy anymore. And they ditch this strategy and start looking for something else. So the point is, has it fallen outside of historical performance norms? So if you go back to, if you've got the back testing data, and if you haven't got that, you should have at least um, journal your trades. Or, and if you don't at the moment, start um, journaling your trades. So you build up the history of trades. Because you might say, well, actually, your data may say, actually, with this given approach, a 10% drawdown historically is perfectly within the realms of its natural ebb and flow of equity so and in, so in fact yeah 10 percent is perfectly normal so and if you're looking to dr jump around well yeah this is you're now getting to sabotage because just at the point when you're jumping out saying i don't like this and you're moving on to another strategy this strategy may be that it starts to hook up again and if you'd have just stayed with it, you'd have been back at new equity highs. So like I've said, this is the stuff that people do all of the time. This is the less obvious stuff. But strategy hopping is very, very common. And it's something that is very easy to do, but you just need to go back over your historical. If you log your trades, go back over all of that and see, okay, am I making this decision because I'm looking at my P&L? Because is the strategy performing still within the realms of its historical drawdowns? For example, in that example, you know, it may well be that that particular strategy has a historical drawdown, max drawdown of, let's say, 20%. So you're only you know, well within that, that historical realm, uh, boundary there, and yet you're looking to ditch it. So you've got to be careful there. So uh, lean on your data. Go back on that if you're using a mechanical-based approach. Um, if you're not, then start logging your trades. And um, because everybody should log their trades um, so that you can go back and look at your own data. So has it fallen outside of the historical norms? If not, are you doing what 90% of traders do, which is jump around? Okay, so review your journal. Did you miss any trades, any errors? Because again, 
when people start looking at things like in this example a drawdown and they want to jump around um that chap that i was talking about earlier on wanted to adjust his strategy purely based on he didn't make as much profit as he as he could have done and then he wanted to make that change well again that's fine but you know uh, you need to review all of that, do some testing on it and test your own data to see, uh, are you more profitable by actually doing that? Or actually, are you sabotaging yourself just to make yourself feel good? And we're going to talk about that in a bit. So review your journal. Did you miss trades? Are there any errors? Because a lot of people will judge themselves based on the, the you know, their P&L. Their P but actually, there might be trades that you've missed, trades you've hesitated on, errors you've made, you've jumped into a trade. All of that will be in your your trade log if you log your trades. And so that is what determines your performance, not the actual p &L. If you If you review constantly what you're doing, and then you can say, well, actually, yeah, your p &L might be whatever it might be. But it would actually be so much better if I hadn't have missed those trades or any of those errors that I've taken. So reviewing your journal is really important here. Yeah. That may show, like I've already said, that there's actually nothing wrong using that 10% drawdown as an example, like um, that, that chap that I've already talked about who wanted the double, you know, with the benefit of hindsight <laughs> when price went up all back came back up into that high and he he opted in not to bank and he wanted to hold on and it and it rolled over so he's now using the benefit of hindsight based on this the the fact that it pulled back over that he could have made more money by banking it up here but as i've said well how many instances would there be where price actually just keeps going he needs to look at that and then only then can he make the decision as to whether he wants to change his exit approach. So all of these are potentially self-sabotaging because he may, going back to this again, one more time, using that example, he may say, no, that's it. Every time it comes up, does a pullback, if it does a pullback and then comes back into that eye, I'm going to bank. Well, that's fine. But again, what's the data on that? Is there, in fact, by... By banking here, yes, that's fine on this trade. But how much of a sacrifice are you having by missing out on those ones that do carry on going higher? So only he'll only know if he tests this. So it's uh, the subtle art of self-sabotage um, because he may actually find that he's making a lot less money by trading that way rather than the original approach he was just reacting so anyway let's move on oh let's turn the pen off first of all then okay so if you want to change the approach like that chap to suit your personality that's absolutely fine because that chap may say yeah i don't want to hang on to that trade my personality is such that i just want to bank it providing the you know the data supports it and it's still profitable well yeah that's fine but definitely needs to look at well how much of a sacrifice is he potentially making by doing that but anyway so that's fine but just ensure don't become a serial hopper and constantly be tweaking your strategy just based on your most recent performance or the most recent experiences okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to another kind of subtle self-sabotage i'm just going to show you some back testing data note that this is purely back testing these are i've just used some software to create some simple a couple of simple back tests here okay so let's have a look at this so this is just showing a back test of a given strategy over a 10-year period okay so it's total return here this is purely backtesting, like I've said. So the total return over the over the backtesting period was 229%, giving an annualized return in that of 10.7%. 10, 10 the maximum drawdown that it had over that period was 26%. 
and the win rate over here is a whopping 27%. Now, some of you won't like that, I know. <laughs> so, remember these numbers. 229%. 10.73% annualized return. Drawdown of 26%. And a win rate of 27%. Okay. With this given strategy. Now, this... It, this strategy at this at this point um, takes a trade. So it has an entry here. And it has a stop loss. A given stop loss. And it has a given uh, target up here. Take profit. Okay, so it has a static take profit, entry and stop loss. Fairly straightforward. Okay. And you can see the, the average win is 5%. The average loss is 1%. So it's around about 1 to 5 risk to reward. Right, now let's go on to the next slide here. Now this one's got some slightly different figures in it. Note, first of all, the win rate has jumped up to 55%. Now some of you will be thinking, it off. Oh, yeah, that's better. Don't like this 27%. Win rate stuff, um, the drawdown is actually slightly higher than the previous one. And look at the annualized return. It's now dropped to 6% or so, 6 and a quarter percent and the total return has more than halved. Okay, so what's the difference? The strategy is exactly the same. The only difference is the stop loss gets moved up to break even yes ladies and gentlemen <laughs> it's another massively common theme with traders wanting to move their stop to break even now there's nothing wrong with moving your stop to break even but where a lot of traders go wrong is have they tested that and a lot of the time they're doing it too soon so in this example, the stop was getting moved to break even once, uh, I don't know, once price has moved a given amount. But the, the point is that there was a massive sacrifice. I think it was when once, uh, the, once, the, um, once it was into profit by 1R then or 1% in this regard, then the stop was moved to break even. But it was a massive sacrifice in returns. So the overall return over the 10-year period halved. The annualized return obviously was lower. Yes, the win rate was higher. And I've pointed this out because there'd be a lot of people who would still say, yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make that a sacrifice just to be right more often. The power, the psychological power of people wanting to be right more often. Of course, we want to be right more often. We would rather have higher win rate strategies but the point is at what sacrifice at what sacrifice are people making purely to essentially have a higher win rate by moving their stops up it's something which don't get me wrong certain strategies will work well will will be improved by moving stops to break even at a given point the point of this what i'm showing here though is have you tested it because <laughs> that example shows how moving a stop to break even could damage overall performance if you move your stop do you know for a fact that that's the best approach again this comes back down to are you sabotaging your total performance just because you want to make yourself feel good? Because that's what it comes down to a lot of the time. People move their stops up because then they can say, oh, it's a risk-free trade. Well, is it a risk-free trade if it's affecting your total performance? So again, we're talking about going back and testing. We've tested thousands of systems, myself and my programmer, We've tested thousands of systems, and guess what? Yeah, you know it. 88% of the, of the tests that we've done on those systems perform better by leaving the initial stop alone. Just leaving it alone. 
because you don't always have to move stops to break even at all. In fact, in that example, you're just better off. You know, you're going to make twice as much money over that 10 year period by leaving the stop alone rather than just moving it up to break even just to make yourself feel good. Yes, you'd still make money, but it's that sabotaging of profit that goes on. So I would encourage people, if you, like most people, I move my stops up on on my trades, but there's a point at which I will move my stops up. So I would encourage people to, if you're using a given strategy, just to question your own strategy and say, okay, I'm moving this stop up at this given point, but actually I haven't back tested that. Am I better off leaving it alone or not moving it until the trade has moved further into profit, first of all? So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. This is what I'm saying here t today. It's about the, the less obvious types of self-sabotage. That's what we're talking about here tonight. We're not talking about the obvious ones because we all know that. This is the stuff that you can take away and say, right, I've got some work to do here. Am I am I strategy hopper? Am I a strategy hopper? Ah, oh, right. Am I needlessly uh, hopping from one strategy to another without even realizing when I'm making changes, making adjustments, the consequences of that? Test it, like that chap in that story. It's fine to bank bank at a double top, but test it. Is it more profitable for you to do that every time you get in a a, a trade setup like that? I like this data that I've just presented here. Do you know that you're more profitable moving your stop to break even or are you doing it because of an emotional reason, i.e. wanting to make yourself feel better? Okay. So what do your stats say? The majority of retail traders are self-sabotaging in that subtle way and they don't, as I say, they don't even realize it. So... Key questions to ask yourself. Am I strategy hopping for the right reason or is it simply to make me feel better? <laughs> Am I moving stops for the right reason or is it simply to make me feel better? Again, are you strategy hopping just to say, oh, I'm going to discard this one because for whatever reason, oh, you know, it's not making me enough money or, um, or, or I'm going to massively adjust it. Well, hold on a second. Are you just massively adjusting it like that chap just on the on the back of a couple of instances? Have you actually got enough data to justify making that change? Go back and test that. Likewise, with moving the stops. Am I just doing it to make myself feel better? Or actually, is it proven that moving those stops is better for me? Record your trades and review both those that you took Plus those that you missed. And this is another thing that people, as part of self-sabotage, that they don't log the trades that they missed. And really, this is this is about people that are following a more systematic approach, following a mechanical rules-based approach. They log all the trades they take. They don't log the ones they, they missed. So why is that important? Because, it, again, it's a collect, you're collecting data. Just because those ones you you missed for whatever reason doesn't mean to say they shouldn't be logged because at least it's giving you that information to tell you whether overall that strategy is even more profitable just because you may have missed some, maybe you hesitated because you'd had a couple of losses beforehand and, um, and fear gripped you a little bit, all of those things. So it's all self-sabotage really and even... When logging a trade, we can be self-sabotaging if we don't log the ones that we missed. So really useful to do that as well. If you trade mechanically, as I've just said, what does the historical backtesting tell you? Simply looking at these two parts of your trading can result in really significant performance improvements. So subtle, yes, but could dramatically change your trading without you having to go and find a new strategy or and with regards to moving stops it you may well find your that your strategy you're sitting on is actually a little gold mine if you just left the stops alone for a bit longer
So really worthwhile having a look at that. And finally, now, um, okay. I thought that, so we've pretty much covered that. I said it would be a, a shorter webinar tonight as far as the actual presentation element. I've just got a couple of slides more to go through here. I had to, I thought, I found this funny and I've got a couple of sentiment slides here. Um, this from Forbes, actually a few months ago. An imminent stock market correction warning suddenly flashed red just as the S&P and uh, 500, uh, what it was saying was just as the S&P was making new highs, this stock market correction warning flashed red. Well, um, right now, uh, this was a few months ago, most of you know where the, what the stock markets have done uh, this year and the S&P and the NASDAQ particularly um, and the Dow, um, they keep on, they've kept on making new highs. And so when you see these sorts of articles, you have to be very, very careful from a sentiment perspective um, that when you see uh, articles like this talking about stock market corrections, look for the reasons why the stock market might go higher. And just like that, let's now look at something else here. The Economist just last week, Economist magazine, I'm sure some of you have seen this, front page the envy of the world america's economy special report with a dollar on fire there so again we can't just immediately use this information and say well in that case the u.s economy is going to probably underperform we we can't and, and and therefore short the dollar but it certainly should be something that we keep an eye on when we see this sort of stuff when we see these types of front uh, magazine covers, and I've done, if you go on to the micro site, I did a whole webinar just recently, one of the, uh, a few months ago, it's on the site, uh, where I covered off uh, set market sentiment. But certainly they are a warning sign. <laughs> um, so, uh, so when we see this sort of stuff, so um, uh, the only thing is, they're not always the greatest of timing tools. You see something like this? Yeah. It may be that going into 2025, the US economy maybe stutters a little bit. I don't know. But it's just so often that when we do see this sort of these sort of articles out there, that the opposite happens. So, for example, what's been going on, what's been attracting a lot of attention from a sentiment perspective in the last week or so, and I'm actually just going to switch to the charts now. Um, there you go. Sentiment extremes. Uh, there you go. There's a webinar there on the um, on the micro site. But if I bring up uh, gold here, gold has been attract has been attracting a lot of attention lately. So. Lots of articles talking about gold going to the moon, gold going to XYZ prices, and all the reasons why gold's doing so well and it's going to continue to do well. The problem that we tend to have when it comes to sentiment is journalists, financial journalists, aren't going to start writing about something until it's already had a great run. So gold is starting to get picked up by the masses now because the masses are starting to hear, oh, gold's having a really good run. I need to get into gold. Paul Tudor Jones, one of the world's most famous hedge fund managers, was in, uh, interviewed on CNBC just two days ago, talking about how he owns what? Gold, Bitcoin, and that he sees them going a lot higher. Now, people would say, well, Charlie, surely Paul Tudor Jones, one of the world's most famous hedge fund managers, in the original Market Wizards books, if he's saying that, oh, I've got to get in. Well, it's a, you know, there's an element of context there. You also have to appreciate that hedge fund managers may talk up their own book at times. <laughs> so is it in his vested interest to talk up gold? Yeah, it may well be. <laughs> so gold is attracting generally a lot of chatter around it at the moment. So from a sentiment perspective, like those um, articles I've just shown, I'm not saying that gold has to come down straight away just because everyone's talking about it. But what we are starting to see is 
the sentiment towards gold is starting to get frothy. So I just think it's um, a warning sign. It's not a timing signal. You don't These sorts of things are not always the best of timing uh, signals, but they are certainly a warning sign that the, a given market or economy may be getting a bit frothy and so start, start to look at technical levels that markets may be going into. And, and certainly be aware when when everybody's long, who's left to buy. So as gold is making more and more news headlines, at some point it's probably going to have to take a breather is what I'm trying to say. So I'm personally, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I am personally invested in gold and silver. I have a vested interest myself in gold, silver going higher. But I also appreciate that they're going to have to pull back at, at points as well. So I'm very uh, attuned to uh, the rhetoric that's going around at the moment. So it doesn't mean to say the gold has to top right now. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying it's starting to get frothy from a sentiment perspective. So it may not be that you know gold may carry on making new highs for the next couple of months. But certainly if that was the case then that rhetoric, that um, frothiness is only going to get, that euphoria is only going to get stronger. So I would then certainly start to get a bit cautious as it gets closer to what? Big round numbers? Where are we at at the moment? Oh yeah, 2,700. We're not that far away from tw uh, from 3,000 now, are we? So just um, a point of note there. So again, back on my micro site, I talk all about sentiment there anyway right let's go back over to oops um the last slides here i don't know if there's anything more here yeah the final slide here then we'll take questions again from bill lipschultz lipschultz now bill lipschultz was again another market wizards i think he was in new, the second market wizards book and he said if a trader is motivated by the money then is it is the wrong reason a truly successful trader has to be involved and into the trading itself. The money is the side issue. The principal motivation is not the trappings of success. It's usually the byproduct. Simply stated, the game is the thing. So if you can always keep that mantra for yourself. Yes, everybody who gets into trading is in it for to make money. But you've got to enjoy it. You've got to be passionate about the art of trading. Because if you're not passionate about the art of, of trading, when the markets aren't doing what you want them to do and maybe they become frustrating, what are you more likely going to do? Become frustrated, bored, or just you know throw in the towel. You have to in, really engross yourself. And that's what Bill's saying. In, and be passionate about uh, trading in its entirety. And um, there we've got our final slide there, which is the risk disclaimer again. Okay, right. Um, nice and succinct here tonight. Let's have a look at some of the any questions or comments that have come through here. Uh, yeah, so someone said, asked uh, Jeffrey if you're still there, uh, the recorded session. Yes, the recorded session. If I go all the way back through the slides to the beginning tonight. Oh, there we go. Um, if you've come in late... If you take this link, tickmill.link forward slash Charlie Burton, um, that is that micro site where these webinars get put on to. So I suspect tonight's webinar will will get put on over the next week or two. Um, it sometimes takes the uh, the technical people at Tickmill, they have to chop up the, you know, the beginning of the webinar and then put it on. So it usually takes a week or two. So all my past webinars, you will see, just scroll down on that page and um, you can access those. Hopefully that's um, answered Jeffrey's question there. Uh, uh, Yusuf, yeah, what gets you is getting stopped by a pip or so, then it goes your way. Okay, so Yusuf, that's a, if you're, you're still there. That's a good question uh, or good comment, should I say. So again, have a look. It may well be that your stops are too tight. If it's happening a lot of the time, 
then that tells us that your stops are to look at your stop placement and you might have to just have a slightly wider stop uh, than you're currently doing. Because if it's happening a lot, then that suggests that there's, that's just a stop placement issue. That's a dollar rocket in it. Yes. Rocketing. Yes. <laughs> yes, Joe. Uh, where or how can I backtest a strategy? Oh, um, well, uh, Dino, you can you can manually do it. So you can manually scroll back the charts. There are pieces of software such as Forex Tester that you can, if you want to use some form of programming, so you can use that as well. So there's loads of way to do it. You can just Google it. But there's no substitute for just bringing the chart up and manually doing it as well. I still like old school backtesting and logging all of the, the historical trades. Um, where do you find the sentiment headlines? How can we track these? Ah, Mahesh, uh, that's my job. <laughs> so I'm always scouring around um, Twitter, uh, Google searches, you name it, Mahesh. So... Um, so yeah, always scouring around in my community, in my trading community. Sometimes it's some of my members will bring up a, um, I've got one from today, actually. One of my members just sh saw this today. So look, I'll bring this up. Uh, let's bring this across. So this was again, quite interesting from a Gave Curl re research. So quite popular in America. But this is almost like a a sentiment indicator here because they've said look at the look at the line up here us bond yields will never return to their post 2008 trading range well the post 2008 trading range is down here basically below 3.2 percent okay so what they're saying is yeah bond yields are never going to go back below 3.2 percent might well be there's a sentiment indicator in there and maybe they do <laughs> so uh yeah within my trading community we we sh yeah. people will say oh have you seen this or have you seen that and and so yeah um, but yeah i'm on the lookout for those things as well um mahesh so yeah uh what software to what do i use for back testing well david i will always backtest manu something manually first myself. And then I have, I've got my own software uh, that, that my programmer put together for me, that myself and my, and my trading community use. So that's, that's my own stuff, stuff. So if you're, if you wanted to become part of my community, then by all means, you, you would then be able to get access to that. But, um, but otherwise, yeah, just manually do it. Just, Bring up the charts, scroll back. I always, if I'm looking at any brand new strategy, I always manually backtest it first of all before I actually hand it over to be auto-tested because I want to see it. I want to see the price bars, how the price bars react, how they move. So you can't see that by plugging it into a system and the system just you know, churning out a, a load of, data and numbers for you so i'm i do like doing that first don't get me wrong i will then then have it auto tested but i always like manually doing it first carlos is saying as a trend follower choppy markets must be hard for you i know you don't strategy hop but do you have other methods to cope with choppy method uh, markets that's a really good question um no <laughs> uh that comes down to the psychological side of things carlos i don't tend to jump around as you as you've said so if a market goes into a choppy period i don't make money that's it people are like oh well that's that's a revelation <laughs> yeah if a market goes into a choppy period i'm not really going to be making any money i need a market to um and i i accept and i'm, I'm okay with yeah of course markets are going to go into choppy periods so i'm not going to adjust and try and jump around all of the time because i know that over the longer term that's actually not gonna that you know just as you jump around 
then a market breaks out. You know? So, um, so no, I just stick with what I do and accept there's going to be periods where I'm going to get chopped up. Yeah. Uh, Adnan, how do you become a member? Um, well, you can become a member for free here. That's why I, that's why I gave you that link earlier on, tickmill.link forward slash Charlie Burton. So um, have check out that webpage. Yeah. Uh, am I right in thinking that uh, this is from Richard? Um, there's a lot of questions coming through here. Some of you are posting them just to host some panelists and some of them uh, you're you're posting uh, so that everyone can see it. it doesn't really matter but you just change the drop down box if you want it so that everyone can see your question am i right in thinking most people are taught the same placement of stop loss so stop hunting is a given so you should place your stop in a less obvious place okay um the answer is twofold to this it's a really good question um uh, okay, let me bring up a chart. Let's use gold here as a nice, uh, as a nice example. So, what Richard's um, saying here is the traditional places to place your stop, i.e., you've got in. I don't know. So let's say you've got in over here somewhere. Pop your stop below the low there. Okay. So the traditional places to place your stop uh, are, you know, you're going to get stop hunted. Well, no, <laughs> not necessarily. Only if a market wants to go that way. There are plenty of examples like this one here where price even here just did a pullback here, wouldn't have come back and stopped you out. And likewise over here. So if you've got in over here somewhere and you put your stop below that low, no, you've not been stopped out because it's, moving in a certain way where it's not happening don't get me wrong there are there are going to be times when you will get stopped out on your low here um so i think there's a lot of people out there who trader gurus who prey on people's fears about getting stopped out so they say right you need to have your stop in a different place <laughs> and which is fine if it works out on a risk reward basis, but what they are really doing is they're just preying on, on people's uh, fears a lot of the time. One of my uh, the members of my community is an ex institutional bank trader who was managing up to a billion pounds of money, and I was chatting with him oh, a year or so ago on a microphone in a joint session. And we were talking about this very subject. And he said, yeah, he said, do people really think that us institutions have got the time or inclination to be running, doing stop hunts for retail traders? We haven't got, we don't care about retail traders. Retail traders aren't big enough in the market to, to make it worth their while to be doing that sort of thing. They're just getting on with their own trading. So these are some of the myths that you hear from trader gurus, unfortunately, um, that are out there and out on social media and stuff because they're just preying on people's fears. So don't get me wrong. Um, they're like uh, Mahesh earlier on. If you're, if you're constantly getting stopped out, then it suggests your stop is too close to the market. But there's nothing wrong with having a stop in a traditional, at a traditional place like that below that low, for example, or below a given low, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And if you just get stop, stopped out, it's fine. Is the, the, the point is, is the strategy, is the approach profitable overall? Doesn't matter if you're, if you're getting stopped out 50% of the time, does it? If, you're over, if the overall risk reward is good and you're going to be making money. So um, yeah. Anyway, hopefully I'll give you some food for thought there. Right. Um, yeah, exactly, Carlos. I hope they answered your question as well. What about trying... Sorry, I'm seeing a lot of questions, you see. There's plenty of people in here again tonight, so lots of questions coming through. Um, what about trying to look, to look into putting your entries where you put your stops? Entries where you put your stops... 
I don't quite understand that. If you put your entries where you put your stops, then you're just going to get stopped. Basically, that would be putting a, so you go long at a given level and then put your stop at that same level. You're just going to get nicked out all of the time. It would be way too tight. So uh, I think what people need to do is accept being wrong more often, getting stopped out more often. There's nothing wrong with it. Test the system and, and or, or strategy and approach, and you'll soon there then see whether that given strategy or approach is profitable with a given stop loss and or you know stop loss placement whatever uh, the data will give you the answer and um, and sometimes the best strategies actually have a win rate of what 40 percent 30 percent all Judah Jones his historical win rate used to be something like 35 percent one of the world's best hedge fund managers Problem is with retail, retail are obsessed with having, you know, eighty percent win rates. Um, so unfortunately. So anyway. Right. Um is it okay to have more than one trading strategy? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh you need mentorship, uh Chasson, uh Gasson, sorry. How can I get it? I'm not here to be offering that sort of stuff, uh Gasson. Um so that's not really why I'm here. I'm here to coach you here tonight on this specific, or, you know, give you some ideas tonight on this particular subject. Um, by all means, you can join my community if you wanted to, but, um, you know, look up. That's on the on the uh, the website that I've given there. Uh, okay. Um, where are we? What are your thoughts on order flow using depth of market and delta footprint for entries on support and resistance zone? Um, yeah, you can use order flow, um, depth of market, you know, if you're an intraday trader, so that's more of an intraday trader, um, tool, um, not really going to be any use for swing trading. Um, but it's just a way of trading. So it doesn't, it's not like, oh, it's some sort of holy grail. Um, so again, you just have to accept that whatever your approach is going to be so using something like order flow it's not it's not it's no guarantee that you're going to be any more profitable with that than any other approach to the market so yeah that's my i'm generally quite pragmatic to trading i don't really care how what style or strategy or approach anyone wants to use um the main point that I always like to make is there aren't holy grails. <laughs> and so it's very, very rare that one particular approach is going to be stand out above another or whatever. So it's really about the individual and how the individual personalizes that approach to the market. Uh, Enzo, self-sabotage has a lot to do, you think, with the subconscious mind. Absolutely. I had a psychologist in my um in my trading room today and so yeah uh, we were covering that very subject um have you used or do you recommend strategies approaches to work on this area well there you go enzo literally i had a psychotherapist um who deals with anxiety in people generally but he's dealt with and he's worked with a lot of traders and so he was talking about things like limiting beliefs and all sorts of other things and and how to choke off some of the subconscious uh, signals that become a uh, or come up to the conscious mind so um so yeah and how he will work with things like that so yeah you know um yes um absolutely it comes down to the subconscious yeah so we can reprogram that by creating habits so and there's lots of stuff that i do on on that uh with people what do you do if self-sabotage uh self-sabotage but it actually ended in a good profit or at least a profit well yusuf um <laughs> if you, you're talking about an individual instance there so what i'm what, what i'm talking about is 
people that are self-sabotaging constantly, it's more like, yeah, you could jump into a trade through FOMO and it works out. Okay. So that's self-sabotage. Yeah. It worked out. But if you carried on jumping into trades you know, time after time and over a hundred instances of you just jumping into trades emotionally, yeah, more likely you're going to be losing money. So yeah, in, a, in an individual instance, um, it may well have worked out. But the problem with that, coming back to the self, uh, the subconscious, you've just trained your subconscious mind. Oh, that was okay. Oh, we're going to do this again. And this is how people create these bad habits. Because if something that you did was, you know, was the wrong thing, but it still made you money, your subconscious is very powerful. And it's going to be saying, well, no, this is great. I, um, I, we're going to do this again. <laughs> um, so you have to be very, very careful. You have to use a lot of self-talk. And so how would I go about that? I would say, uh, if I carry on doing this, I may have made money today doing this, but out of a hundred instances of me doing this, I will lose. And you need to repeat that sort of message and get it ground in. Because then you can say, oh, yeah, phew, I got away with that one. But if I kept on doing that, I'm going to end up losing money. So I can't afford to just jump into trades on a whim. I'm using a FOMO as an example now. Do you see what I mean? Self-language, self-talk is so, so important. Um, right. Um, sorry, I'll carry on now because there's a lot of questions here and I'm... We're doing the usual here where I'm trying to catch up with the question. How does one get rid of strategy hopping? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> Sean. Um, again, you know, if you are a culprit of strategy hopping, like I've went through earlier on in the presentation, the data will tell you. So, But the data will tell you whether you're jumping away from something where there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're still finding you're doing that... Then again, self-language, come, self-talk comes into play. If I give up this strategy right now, only to go into this new strategy, is that going to be to the detriment of my overall profitability? Uh, yeah, I have been here before. Yeah, it probably will be. Again, this self-language, self-talk is so, so important. Yusuf is saying, one guru said stop losses are the main reason why traders fail on a big YouTube channel. Well, I don't need to know whoever the name of that because we can't share that publicly. But it's people like that who give the industry a bad name. You know, ultimately, in that they're, they're, they're preying on, on people's need, desire to be right as much as possible. Don't use stop losses. You're just going to get stopped out. So don't use them. <laughs> and if you, if any of you have heard any of the interviews with the the owners of Tickmill, who are hedge fund managers themselves, they will confirm that a high percentage, because they can't control what their clients do, but a large percentage of their clients don't use stop losses. And guess what happens to them? Yeah. And we get this across... Any broker out there in the industry will say the same thing. You know, traders will get away without using stop losses a lot until that one trade that just, you imagine if you'd have said, right, that's it, I'm going to short gold down here, right? I'm going to short it. And then that one trade, it doesn't ever come back for you. And it just keeps coming back and you're sweating through this consolidation. Maybe it's going to roll down back for me and I can get out down here only for it to then carry on up and up and up until you end up blowing up. So, um, no, I'm never going to recommend that sort of thing. Uh, why an MT5 and TradingView chart commonly timeframes are in odd numbers, such as two-minute time frame chart will have less noise than one-minute time frame. Is following an odd number time frame a good idea? Um, okay. Yeah. So five, a five minute chart. Uh, yeah. We, we do, um, impose, um, 
and maybe our own psychology in that from a time perspective into our charting time intervals. So we go five minute, 15 minute charts. <laughs> um, I don't know. The one thing that I will say to you, Arafat, is please don't trade off of one, one two minute charts. You shouldn't be doing that anyway. <laughs> so yeah, go up the time frames a bit. One minute time frames, you know, two minute time frames. It's a bit dangerous, really. So I'm not going to advocate that anyway. Um, what markets do you trade? Always the same or changing? Um, mostly the currencies, gold, and the stock market indices. You know, to to gold, silver. Those are the markets that I'm analyzing all the time. The major currency pairs. Gold, silver, S&P 500, NASDAQ, you know. So, yeah, in the main. Um, I'm doing intermarket analysis on other markets. So I'm looking at uh, the bond market a lot of the time. And um, obviously I look at oil as well. But actually physically trading is the major currencies um first and foremost and then i will through the year trade the uh the stock market indices as well so there you go um what well, what if you know about self self-sabotaging and the various ways they play out but once you are on the charts all of those knowledge all that knowledge flies out the window only to come back after you mess up yes absolutely how can you change that 100 percent. that's a so common i said that in the presentation earlier on i'll just bring the presentation slides up if i but i said in the the presentation slides earlier on that um that yeah you know logically people will know a lot of the time the things they should and shouldn't be doing and then when they put money on the line and when they actually start trading, then that all flies out the window, as you quite rightly say there. So you're saying, you know, all that stuff. But once you're, you know, once you're in the charts, all that knowledge flies out the window. How uh, and um, only to come and mess you up. How can one manage that? Well, I know I'm a bit behind here. There's 26 new messages I haven't read yet. But hopefully I've given you some ideas as far as self-talk is concerned. So another example would be, okay, when you're as to use an arresting mechanism, all right. So you're about to you want to jump into the market because the market's moving and it's doing something. You need to then sort of say, look, if I take this trade right now, and it and it rolls over and it stops me out, will I kick myself? Will I be upset with myself? Because if the answer is yes then you don't take the trade. You need to keep using self-talk all of the time. Yeah, actually, if I take that trade now and it doesn't work, yeah, I should, you know. So this, I work a lot with traders on um, the psychological side of trading. So using self-talk is all important because if you say to yourself, well, if I take this trade right now and it, and, um, and it stops me out, yeah, I'll be upset with myself. There's your answer. Don't take the trade. Because every trade you take, if it's a losing trade, that doesn't mean it's a bad trade. It's just a losing trade. So there's your answer. Just being stopped out on a trade doesn't mean the trade was a bad trade. It should be a good trade that just got stopped. That's all. What Did it follow your plan? Yes. Right. It was a good trade then. It just didn't work out on that instant. If you took 100 trades of that setup you wouldn't expect a hundred of them to work out that's why we use stop losses but over the course of that hundred we'll end up being net profitable if we stick with the rules etc so self-talk is really important it helps act as an arresting mechanism so another one is i can't afford to take that trade i can't afford to jump in the trade in into the market there because if i did that Every time jumping in over the next hundred hundred trades, oh uh, yeah, I'm prob it may work on this instant right now, but all I'm going to do is feed myself my subconscious, and I'm going to do it over and over and over again, and I'm going to end up losing money. So even if I jump into the trade right now and it makes money, 
All that's going to happen is I'm creating a bad habit. I can't afford to take that trade. See? Self-talk. I have loads of that stuff. Good stuff. Uh, not quasi. Good, 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 good. Um, uh, you're going to have to bear with me, folks, because um, you may have writ written comments ages ago, and I'm only just catching up on some of them. Um, Yusuf, you know, you're saying, yeah, even even when you actually say you want to exit on a certain level, sometimes you freeze and you don't exit. So better leave it to the system or to close it. Uh, well, you don't have to auto, auto trade. Um, you're still going to suffer with psychology, psychological issues. If you, even if you, if you're, if you haven't got on top of your mindset, you're still going to have mindset issues. Even if you were to set up your strategy and have it auto trade for you, because you're still going to be watching the results. And then when the results are going fine, yeah, you're comfortable with it. And when the results are going, you know, pulling back a bit, you're more likely to, oh, I think I'll switch it off now and all of that. So it always comes back down to mindset. Don't ever think that, you know, an automated sort of program approach is is the is the answer because it's not. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Arafat, uh, you're asking, yeah, why don't they have that as a default um, on those time frames? Sorry, yeah. Um, well, yeah, but you can put those in. You just manually put those time frames in, Arafat. So that's you can do that in TradingView. I don't know about MT5. I'm sure you can. Um, you can do it on MT4, so I'm sure you can do it on MT5. So there you go. How important is lunch? Oh, <laughs> I was going to answer how important is lunch there from Sean. Very important, Sean. But uh, lunch liquidity, um, not really that important um, to me. Um, again, you're you're coming at it from a from an intraday perspective. Um, you know, the the lunchtime period. Yes, markets can go a bit quieter uh, at certain times of the day, but other days they won't, and so. You know, I, I'm not that big on uh, liquidity, as people use that word, um, because there are times when markets are, um, you know, during what would you would think be a quieter period, and they're not. So, um, I don't think so. Time scales do I trade? I'm a swing trader nowadays, uh, Talma. I, although I've won trading competitions, these days I swing trade because of time and um takes up too much time um intraday trading for uh, uh, how i used to trade so now i just swing trades which still means that i will swing trade off of i'll come right down to you know four hour charts sometimes even an hourly if i'm looking to get into a swing trade off a given level um so i will still still come down to sub daily time frames but in the main i'm trying to run my trades for multiple days or multiple weeks more so multiple weeks uh, my thoughts on the stock markets for q4 ah now adnan um i can't because in two weeks time actually it's not even two weeks time it's a week next sunday we're doing a webinar so that's sunday the 3rd of november we're doing a webinar on the really the outlook around and post the election so i i better not go into all that now so mark it in your diary um we're doing a tick mill webinar on sunday the 3rd of november so that's two days before the u.s elections so we're doing an election special on that good stuff good stuff i'm seeing the Um, you meant stop loss rather than a mental stop. Uh, oh, I've, I've done. I'm lost now, Yusuf. I've just caught up with your bit. Some people say no stop loss in just a mental stop. Mental stops are for mental people. <laughs> so the thing is, you even God uses stops. Just remember that. 
So that's, we always use that as a line. Even God uses stops. <laughs> so <laughs> the um, if you use a mental stop, okay, you've got to then have the discipline. If your mental stop is here, uh, whatever that level is, I'll just write on 103. Okay, there's a couple of things to mention here. One, you've got to have the discipline to actually come out, which is actually quite difficult because then people say, well, I'll just give it a little bit of wiggle room. And then before they know it, price has gone a lot lower than where their mental exit was going to be. Or you go and get some news and it flushes right through that level. So then again, you get a worse stop out, even if you do come out. But then what can happen is then people don't want to come out. They think, oh, well, I'll wait for it to come back up and then I'll come out. Well, what if it doesn't and it carries on coming lower? It is ridiculous. Anyone who advises mental stops, you know, they don't know what they're doing. I'm being pretty serious here. So, and also, do you really think the market is coming down for your one lot trade? Because the market knows your one lot stop loss order is there. So if this is your stop loss, if you did put a physical stop loss in, do you really think the market is coming for your one lot when there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of lots in the market? No, it's not. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. There's my answer. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, what was the date again for the webinar? The 3rd of November. Looks like we've got to the end of the questions, but if you have got any more, by all means, uh, I've caught up by looks of things now on the questions. So if you've got any more, by all means, do write them down. I'm not going to talk about the markets at the moment, um, specifically in relation to the election because of that uh, webinar that we're going to be doing on the 3rd anyway. So, um, But thank you very much for all of your questions again there um and hopefully i've been able to answer and at least give you some food for thought tonight on testing your data testing whether you're moving your stops up is the right thing testing whether actually are you jumping strategy just before you know when there's absolutely nothing wrong with it so uh, there you go yeah thank you mahesh and thank you, everyone else there. Uh, there's still loads of people logged in, but um, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll I'll keep talking while everyone's coming through. Talma, thank you. Arafat, um, you're saying this discussion helps you a lot. Good. Um, yeah, do check out the other webinars on the uh, the um, the micro site there. If I bring it back up, because there are uh, where's it gone? There. Um, there's a there's a few in there. Um, I don't know if I did if there's one in on psychology in there so one look no okay um it doesn't look like i've got any in there that's uh one for the one for the near future then uh by the looks of things i've definitely done one before but maybe it's just not not uploaded in there so um we'll do one on trading psychology at some point as well uh joe thank you uh British, uh, thank you, uh, Adnan, Teresa, Yusuf, again, how many sessions your silver membership get? Uh, oh, you've been on my website, haven't you? Um, I think they get two a week. We do, we tend to do about, just to give you an idea, three or four sessions a day, um, they get two a week. There you go. All right. I'm going to leave you to it. Enjoy the rest of your days or your evenings. And thank you for coming along.